I'm Representative Dave Pinto. I'm the chair of the House Early Childhood Finance and Policy Committee, and I'm calling this meeting of the committee to order. A welcome to uh, members and members of the public. This meeting is being called pursuant to House Rule 10.01, which allows for virtual hearings of this type. And I want to direct the attention of members of the public to our committee website, where you'll find a number of materials relating to the meeting, including our agenda. And so with that, I'm going to ask Ms. Chambers to please take the roll. Representative Pinto, chair. Present. Representative Pryor, Vice Chair. Present. Representative Franson. Uh, Franson, present. Representative Bennett. Present. Representative Bolden. Present. Representative Daniels. Present. Representative Dabney. Present. Representative Damon. Present. Representative Jurgens. Present. Representative Cotiza Watoon. Present. Representative Morrison. Present. Representative Waslowitz. Present. And Representative Wolgamot. Wolgamot, present. And we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Chambers. And Representative Pryor, if you could move approval of the February 25th minutes. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any additions or corrections to those minutes, members? And hearing none, all in favor of approval of the February 25th minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes uh, and the minutes have been approved. We have another really busy day, members and members of the public. And just a reminder that we're, uh, we're attempting to fit uh, a lot into limited hearing time uh, because of our nature of our, of our virtual sessions. Uh, we really uh, can't go along, et cetera. And so this is why we're fitting a lot in. So I'm gonna ask um, folks who are testifying and go presenters and all just keep that in mind that uh, unfortunately I'm gonna have to be pretty strict in terms of just, just a couple of minutes per person, et cetera. So my apologies to that. Um, first, we're going to hear a brief presentation on um, uh, an effort to uh, bring together two strands that we've talked a lot about in this committee on the child care side and the early learning and early educator side, um, which I think is really exciting and good to hear about that um, in the epic presentation. And then we'll hear a couple bills after that. Um, and so um, uh, we're going to hear, as I say, just a brief presentation from a couple folks. I'm going to ask uh, Sarah Ford. Uh, to begin, I believe. And so if you can, uh, you had spoken to our committee before, um, but if you could please identify yourself again and um, begin your presentation, that'd be great. Oops, we, uh, we've, uh, yep, we're gonna get you unmuted. Uh, Sarah, if you can, Ms. Ford, uh, if you can. there you go, please. Morning, you everyone. Go. My name is Sarah Ford and I'm actually splitting my time again with Robin Wansley, if Robin is here and ready to go. Yeah, uh, thank you. So, um, uh, Ms. Wantley, please identify yeah. yourself and proceed. Yep. Hello, uh, and good morning, uh, members of this committee. Uh, my name is Robin Wansley Wallaba, and I am here with Education Minnesota, um, and primarily my colleague, Sarah Ford, to briefly introduce um, our 18 month partnership with Isaiah and to stand in support of the creation of a new department. Um, we've been in this partnership with Isaiah's Kids Count on Us Coalition, uh, which represents more than 450 child care centers across the state um, for over a year now. And we've worked together towards developing a policy that does two specific things. Um, one being creating equitable and affordable care and education programs um, that are aligned with early indicators of progress for all of Minnesota's zero through four year olds and those who need it. Um, and second, to interrupt the current system that exploits uh, the workforce um, that has dedicated uh, to caring for and educating our youngest leaders and learners. Um, and it's a system that profits through uh, paying poverty wages of those very workers um, and also leads to uh, chronic poverty amongst those workers, high turnover, um, and it's just overall terrible for our children's development and the stability of these centers. Um, and it also leads to Minnesotans uh, paying roughly $23 million a year in social services to child care workers. So this commitment from our partnership and coalition from day one has been to advance a policy that further the goals of those two things um, and not to pit them against each other. And we're really excited about moving forward with this with you all. So I'll pass it to Sarah. Please, uh, Sarah Ford. Thank you, Sarah Ford, Education Minnesota. So during this time, we examined prop programs and interviewed pr practitioners in West Virginia, New Jersey, Washington, Washington, DC, New Mexico, Wisconsin, 
as well as some county and citywide initiatives that are really interesting, such as those in San Antonio, Boston, Seattle. We've been in conversation with and or relied heavily on the work already provided by Head Start, Power to the Profession, the National Institute on Early Education and Research, Transforming Minnesota's Early Childhood Workforce, which has done just a lion's share of the, of the work around how to raise up this workforce, and labor economists at the U of Minnesota. So here are our key findings. I'll just go over them quickly and then turn it over. The argument that children and, ages- And actually, actually um, if I could just interrupt you for a second, I just want to direct everyone's attention that I believe that there's uh, both uh, the paper from this work and also the summary uh, as well in both PDF form on our committee website. And just want to make sure that folks were aware that they do have sort of those that in the form of handouts. So please continue. Thank you, Representative. So here are the key findings um, after all that work, um, which was done, as Robin said, with a team of practitioners from the child care settings and a team of early education educators from the education system. Uh, the, the argument that children ages birth through four need nothing more than a safe place to be while their parents are, parents are in the workforce, commonly thought of as care, is false and ignores decades of research and new understanding about childhood and brain development. The argument that holds that K-12 is strictly about education and not about care is false. Minnesota has ignored the critical needs of our birth through four-year-olds, including their need to have any options at all and their universal need for high quality pre-K and suffers damage that will last for decades because of it. The birth through four care and education workforce made up primarily of women, many of them women of color has been historically maligned, undercompensated, undersupported. And these conditions are currently at crisis levels. This is a really key component in, our, in all of our minds, the racial, linguistic, and cultural diversity of our current early care and education workforce is a tremendous strength, one that is not mirrored in the K-12 workforce. And we must both immediately and over time address the needs of the workforce dedicated to caring for our young, and, edu and educating our youngest citizens. Um, so our recommendations to create a new state agency strictly devoted to all programs and revenue streams related to zero through four care and education so that the state's governance system can use the same vocabulary and align practices and both support and elevate this critical work. Create regional early care and education hubs, which are overseen by representatives of public schools, child care centers, special education practitioners, English language learning practitioners, and community members. Create a pre-K system that can be run through both public schools and private centers aligned with the early indicators of progress and built on equitable practice, a system that excludes no family wanting access. Create a sustainable funding source so that low income families pay nothing but all other families pay up to but no more than 7% of family income and we are fully in support of the 7% cap that this committee is going to talk about later today. So I want to just make we're not going to testify at that time but want to make note that we're fully in support. Create a community needs assessment tool to be used on an ongoing basis by the early care and educational regional hubs who can use this CNA community needs assessment as a continuous improvement tool that's shown to be with our, 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 our um, full service community schools at, at, at just a tremendous way to make sure the school is meeting the needs of the particular community in which it's based. And the same could be true here for our early care and learning hubs. With child care workers and both alternative and traditional teacher preparation representatives at the table, and that's really important with the child care workers and those represented at the table develop a career wage ladder that offers child care workers the opportunity to work toward adopted standards for credentialing while continuing to earn a living, including credit for prior learning and portfolio options for child care workers who already have deep expertise in the field. Create a funding mechanism to immediately raise the wages of birth through four workforce and to create and to increase compensation benefits and professional development via a career wage, excuse me, a career wage ladder and on-ramping process. So that's the sum of our project, and I will turn it over, represented to the next speaker. Thank you so much, uh, and and again, everyone, I want to direct your attention to um, to this work in the form of a report that we can actually read on our website. So, the next speaker is um, Mary Solheim. If you can please identify yourself, I think we've heard from you as well in this committee, and uh, please proceed. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Mary Solheim. I'm a director at Play School Child Care in Maplewood for the past 10 years, but I've also been a licensed school teacher and I'm also a leader with Kids Count and Us. And I'm gonna to speak to you today from the child care side. I also want to talk about why EPIC is right for Minnesota. 
because it will deliberately create a healthy early learning and care program that makes sense for our youngest kids. Um, it also will most importantly create a new paradigm for early learning, one that really reflects what Minnesota values and that would be our kids. Uh, the challenge that Epic truly faced when we came together was creating a space that two large systems working with kids and sometimes the same kids to come together. We didn't know each other. We didn't know each other's language and we decided to come together anyway. And what that did was legitimize childcare as a working partner. Well, maybe Sarah didn't know this, and this would actually happen, but our first conversations began inside of a circle. There was a current of energy that just flowed between all of us. Coherence began, confluence of ideas and pathways were generated. These two vastly different worlds were discovering common ground. And that energy would actually survive this pandemic. So here we are today, opening that circle to include all of you. I know this journey is not going to be easy. It is why I must really address the importance of this new agency and creating it. Because our childcare system exists within an overwhelmingly oppressive fear-based system within the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Childcare should be a creative thriving space for our kids. One that attracts our most energetic, creative and talented teacher, but it struggles trying to navigate a system that uses punitive actions, consequences and fines as a way to control our childcare landscape. Our licenses can be revoked, denied, conditioned, decertified or classified as not in good standing requiring an already financially st strapped industry to pay thousands of dollars providing a defense for themselves. This process can take a year or longer to resolve. It became very clear to me that this system needs some change uh, during this pandemic. Uh, when the money for childcare was going to be provided for support, um, the DHS system withheld this money from some child cares that actually deserved it because their license was still caught up in a lengthy appeal process. But what really stunned me is that they actually found it necessary to personally contact those centers and tell them not to apply. Once again, the child care system felt like less than what was needed in Minnesota. I know and we need to need to have you need to have you wrap up Ms. Sohan. Yep, I Sorry, will. Just just because of time. No, oh, I am absolutely, um, I'm reminded of uh, uh, saying that shaped my life. My grandmother would tell me that making decisions is really easy, but the decisions you make based on what you value shows the world you saw. And I believe that Epic has got that. I'm going to ask you to support that. Thank you. Thank you. And and uh, and final testifier um, regarding this, our final presenter, I guess, is uh, Ms. Zachary, if you can please identify yourself. And just as I briefly again, we've got just just a couple minutes for you here. Hi, um, my name is Kiara Zachary. I'm a single mother of two, an equity and inclusion manager in the West Metro. I'm also uh, with Kids Count on Us um, and the Epic Group. Um, so um, education is important to me um, because I come from a long line of educators who taught me with education comes power and opportunities. These opportunities can begin for our youngest Minnesotans as young as eight weeks old. We know that families with access to quality early childhood education are giving their children an educational head start. Due primarily to affordability, low income families and families of color don't have this opportunity and therefore opportunity gaps exist in early education and persist in K-12 and post-secondary as well. Besides providing educational opportunities for kids, access to quality and affordable childcare allows for families to better support themselves. Personally, I wouldn't have been able to finish my bachelor's degree or my master's degree without having had received childcare assistance. Um, these degrees have made it possible for me to find a job that can actually financially support myself and my children. I've been able to purchase a home. Um, but it was really difficult for me to keep and maintain child care assistance. Um, it, it, it seemed as if there were always things getting in my way. Um, and 
there would be no way for me to work or to finish my studies had I had I not been um, made had childcare not been made affordable to me or I had somewhere for my kids to go during these times. Um, and um, they, I'm sorry, I lost my spot. That's, that's um, okay. <laughs> Um, the reimbursement rates are so low that many of the centers that I felt, um, it was hard for me to find a center that would accept child care assistance or that would accept state funding. Um, and so it was really hard for me to find the balance that I, I was looking for somewhere that my daughters would enjoy, but then also somewhere that, um, was safe and had quality, uh, as well. Um, also the work that, that once I did find a center, the work that, um, these wonderful phenomenal teachers were doing, um, they weren't being paid appropriately for it um, because the reimbursement rates were, were so low um, once we did find the center. Um, <clears throat> um, we probably, I'll probably have to have you wrap up kind of momentarily here, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Um, no. Yeah. No. Okay, so opportunity, this is what's important. Um, opportunity for kids and families for small art, child care assistance or, or enacting child care for all. Um, Opportunities for kids and families for small art. There's opportunities for small business owners and their communities. I wouldn't be where I am today without childcare being made affordable for me. I know that there are so many families and working women like myself that just need the opportunity to stabilize um, in order to grow so their children can be afforded the same opportunities that my daughter has. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And members, uh, I, I really I want to thank, um, again, you, you picked this up, that there's this group of um, child care providers, uh, early educators, um, and even making that distinction, as, as, as Sarah Ford said, doesn't make a lot of sense, but working together really hard for many months, and I'm so grateful to them for their work. Um, and, uh, and again, want to direct everyone's attention to the report on that. We have a, just a couple minutes for questions, but I should note that one important um, recommendation from this work was the bill that we're about to hear. Uh, coming from Representative Bolden. And so we can also kind of have the conversation lead into that. But if anybody has a quick question, we can do that. But otherwise, um, I might suggest that we that we move into that bill, um, which is one of the pieces that came out of this, in addition to the suggestion for the new department, which we had heard, um, I guess it was last week. Anybody have anything um, before we move on to that bill? Um, I just, again, want to thank so much uh, those of you who did this work and Recognize the bill that we're about to hear is uh, is that. So thank you so much. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Representative Bolden then um, to please uh, move uh, House File 1278, if you wish, uh, to bring it before the committee. Yes, Mr. Chair, so moved. Thank you so much. And so um, Representative Bolden, I don't think you have any amendments. And so if you can uh, please uh, begin presentation of your bill. I know you've got a couple of uh, testifiers. Um, and again, we kind of heard a little bit of the groundwork as we have for the past bunch of, a bunch of weeks uh, as well um, to lead right into this. So please, Representative Bolden. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for hearing this bill today. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed what members of this committee know has been a problem for a long time. The child care and early education model in our state does not work for many families, educators, or our, or, or our businesses. When we hear advocates and professionals in the early childhood world say that the system is not working, it's because at a time in most young families' lives when they can least afford it, we ask them to pay a huge percentage of their income towards childcare. Some estimates are as much as 45% of the average working uh, family's income goes to childcare. While choices for quality remain terribly uneven across the state and favor those with the greatest resources. And despite these very high costs, the caregivers and teachers who are doing this incredibly important work with our youngest Minnesotans are some of the lowest earners in our entire economy. This is also an equity issue as most of these caregivers and teachers are women and many are people of color. House file 1278 creates the Great Start for All Minnesota Children Task Force mandated to set Minnesota on a path to universal childcare affordability and access. The task force will develop a plan to ensure that by 2031, no Minnesota family pays more than 7% of its income to childcare and education for kids zero to five. It would also ensure early childhood caregivers and educators are paid a living wage. Next, Mr. Chair, I would like to turn to my testifiers. And after we hear from them, I will give a brief walkthrough uh, through the bill before we move to questions. Thank you so much, Representative Bolden. I think that the first testifier then is Kristen Raggetts. Welcome to our committee and please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you. I'm Kirsten Raggetts and I've taught pre-K and kindergarten in the Minneapolis public schools for 24 years. I also have experience teaching in childcare centers and I'm a member of the EPIC team. 
I didn't realize I wanted to teach until a few years after college. I was living on the East Coast, so I went to Boston University to earn a master's degree in early childhood. In Massachusetts, early childhood meant birth through age eight and qualified me to teach up to third grade. But I moved to Minnesota, where my degree did not qualify to me to teach in a public school. So with my newly minted master's degree, I got a job at a corporate daycare center in Eden Prairie. My talented and shockingly underpaid colleagues taught me a lot about teaching that I had not learned in grad school. It was 1993 and I made $7 an hour. And at the end of my first year, I was offered a 10 cents an hour raise. Decades later, the average hourly salary of a childcare teacher in Minnesota is around 13 an hour. So we have made very little progress in paying some of our most important teachers a living wage. I quit that job and got a job at a little nonprofit center where I was paid a bit better and went to St. Thomas at night so I could get licensed to teach in a public school. A year later, I was hired to teach kindergarten at a school on the north side. I loved teaching kindergarten, but I went home every day feeling like a failure. I simply could not give my students all the experiences they had missed in their first five years and get them ready for first grade. I mean, I had students who got distracted at the sink when washing their hands and would spend a long time playing with bubbles because they had never had that chance before. Had their parents been able to afford childcare, they would have had all sorts of opportunities for learning through play. As a pre-K teacher, I went home feeling every day like a success. I knew that I had made a difference in children's lives because I could give them the rich experiences that every young child needs. I want those opportunities to be available for all of Minnesota's children. I hope today's presentation and our testimony encourages the legislature to make much needed investments in our youngest learners. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Raggetts. Thank you for your work and for sharing your, uh, your experience with us. Um, it's really helpful. Um, uh, Monique uh, Stum is, uh, is next. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. If you could please identify yourself. Yeah, please. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Monique Stuman. Uh, I am in support of this um, 1278 bill because it's time for Minnesota to have um, child care affordability and more payments for our very dedicated teachers and caregivers. And I wanna put a note there that we are definitely on the first front lines. And um, on a personal note, um, I just wanna talk about, I had a family at our church. Um, they had a tragic uh, thing to happen to them. The grandparents were over 70, both of them. And it was hard for them to find care for those six children that they had to um, care for. My church came up with uh, a plan to try to help these families, but this is something that we need to do. We need to make this right. So many moms come in my door and they say, I, I make just above the cutoff and I have to go and quit my job just so that I can get childcare, so I can qualify for childcare. That is not fair no matter what your race is, no matter what your income is, we should be helping these families. I'm, you know, I'm trying to help my families and I'm also trying to get the best teachers that I can. It's hard, it's like I'm in a catch 22 because I'm a private owner. I want to pay people what they deserve. Um, with this pandemic that just happened, I mean, the, the stress level of being on the front line is heavy for us. And so I want to be able to pay qualified teachers. I want to be able to keep my families. I want to be able to try to maintain um, my staff. And I can't do that if childcare is not affordable for these um, families. We need to be able to do this. We need to make this right. We need to recognize the people that are on the front lines. We can, you know, send all the emails and text messages and letters and saying you all support us show us that you support us show us and so i am in support of this bill you know i've had my own children that i had to raise and i had to have them part-time at my aunt's and part-time at the daycare in which i worked because i couldn't afford um child care so i've been there i understand it which is one of the reasons that i opened up a daycare so what i want to say is let's make a difference in these families they need our support and they need our help thank you 
Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Newman. And uh, finally, uh, Cindy Cunningham is the final testifier who a person who signed up to testify on this. Ms. Cunningham, if you can please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. All right, give me a moment here, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and okay. I hadn't had a chance to test first, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, and I apologize, I'm actually in my recovery of my second shot, so it's a little mm -hmm. exhausting at times. Um, so Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Cindy Cunningham. I have been a licensed family child care provider in St. Paul for 24 plus years, and I am the current public policy chairperson for Minnesota Child Care Provider Information Network, MCPIN, which is the 501c3 statewide association for licensed child care providers. On behalf of McPen, I am testifying in opposition to House File 1278 to establish a task force for early care and education. I have had many roles in life. I've also not had 18 months uh, to put together reports. So this hopefully can be cut short. This mostly, my experience mostly consisted over the past 40 years has been having the boots on the ground in the lives of children and their families. My professional life has included a BA degree in vocational home economics, early child education and parenting with a teaching degree, training in chemical dependency counseling, ongoing training in child development and family engagement. I worked as a youth director for, for churches throughout Western Minnesota in many situations, including chemical dependency, emotional crisis and suicide. I have been a provider for 25 years, nine plus years of being an advocate for licensed family child care providers nine years of being involved in public policy, including numerous official work groups, task forces, and discussions to influence changes in the system of early childhood education and the state, excuse me, <clears throat> and how it impacts children and families. I have raised three children through the early childhood special ed system, the public school system, and they have uh, accomplished, uh, maybe in spite of myself, um, much in their lives. I have a deep and broad experience in early childhood in Minnesota. I am respected for my views and my ability to identify challenges and suggest solutions. I work collaboratively all the while speaking primarily for licensed family child care. I was included in one meeting of this group, of the EPIC group, and it was apparent that LFCCs were not um, adequately understood. There is a failing Minnesota early childhood system in Minnesota. It is just disjointed, many programs, many systems with oversight, difficulty in communication and coordination. There are challenges with funding distribution of the program money. Two groups have come together to attempt to have a new approach to what, to what they have identified as the failings in the system. It is hard work. It is much harder to come up with a valuable conclusion and proposal with the method that they have chosen. Two organizations have come together, spent 18 months, months, much in a pandemic and without personal contact, relying on technology to research studies. Two organizations who have not been directly involved in the attempts of many other experts in Minnesota to develop programs and systems based on research to support children and families in early childhood education. Two organizations who have taken a national view of a topic and failed to fully engage and respect those within our own state. One organization has historically been critical of early childhood educational performance, excuse me, professionals, unless they were in a school-based licensed teacher capacity. These organizations came into the study with the prescribed notion that there are aspects in the current system that are faults and therefore they threw everything out in entirety. Everything, everyone. All the work that has been put forth for years for serving children has been based on research and the best decisions at the time. These are not been valued. The visual of throwing the baby out with the bathwater seems more applicable than I care to think. It is our children, families, early childhood education and experts who are being thrown out. The Ms. Cunningham, I'm you to just, if you could, if, sorry, if you could just wrap up pretty quickly just because of time. I, I will try. However, there's been a loud voice and none of it has included licensed family child care. Licensed family child care is half of the, their pie that they show. We have not been included. Their definition of care is false and is not one that we embrace. The chart on page 22 compares the most expensive care with the least expensive higher education. And, and, and Ms. Cunningham, if I could just pause you for a second, are you talking about the bill, page 22 of the bill? Um, I'm talking, we're talking about, the, about base, the, the basis of the bill is the is the report. The report has failed unless we're willing to look and discuss the basis of the bill. You can't discuss the bill. The, the bill is false. It did not include all family child care. It did not include all providers. It also does not even include it in the lexicon of the report so, of which the bill is based. 
So, Ms. Cunningham, well, just because of time, I'm going to have to ask you to, to wrap up, if you can, please. Um, I'll try. It is okay. not, I will, I will send in my words, um, but it is not surprising that a union oriented SEIU teachers union, as mentioned the document, is the one that came up with a stretch from the power of the profession to say that all early childhood educators should be licensed teachers. There's, there's a need for the overhaul of the system. There's need for work, yes, but two organizations just throw everything out as disingenuous. A task force that would address all of early childhood by an inclusive method with all professionals in all settings and all care providers is what could be needed. Please don't accept and assimilate the study, its conclusions and its proposals, its faulty thinking. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Cunningham. And I'll turn things back to Representative Boldman. And, and I will, represent Boldman, if you can, when you, uh, as you wrap up and we move to questions, I guess if you can point out, I, I believe that, that uh, family child care is, is certainly represented on the task force, I think in a, in a couple ways, so if you can, for, for, your, for your proposal. So if you can please um, do that. Thank you so much. Yes, Mr. Chair, I, I, will, I will make note of that when we get to that point. Thank you. Uh, so thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. Um, and so I'll now give a brief walkthrough of the bill. And so uh, subdivision one sets out three goals to address and solve the early uh, child care and early learning crisis we are facing. The first goal is to create a system under which no family pays more than 7% of its income for early child care and education. The second goal is ensuring that every child has access to high quality early care and education, regardless of their race, income, or zip code. The third goal is increasing compensation and professional development opportunities for the folks doing this incredibly important work. Subdivision two creates the task force to develop strategies to address these goals. Subdivision three identifies the task force membership. This is comprised of 19 voting members who are those closest to this issue and this work. Um, and I'll note there are, uh, they are sort of spelled out, which I won't go through all the details of them, but there are um, specifically called out two individuals who are license holders of family child care programs, one from greater Minnesota and one from the seven county metropolitan area. Um, also included on the task force would be seven non-voting members from state agencies to provide technical assistance. Subdivision four lays out how the task force is to operate or and run. Subdivision five requires the task force to develop a plan to meet these goals. Subdivision six lays out strategies that must be used in the plan to address affordability and access. Subdivision seven lays out strategies that must be used in the plan to address compensation to the early child care and learning workforce. Subdivision eight sets a timeline for the plan to be implemented from 2025 to 2031 while minimizing disruptions to our current public funding system. Uh, and subdivision nine sets out when the task force reports are due with preliminary findings due in mid 2022 and the final recommendations in early 2023. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would ask for member support and I would be happy to take any questions and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much. And so members, uh, uh, now's the time for questions or comments about this, uh, this proposal. Um, I do want to make sure to call folks attention to the to the representatives of uh, to the license holders of family child care programs that in the bill just to the to that last testifier and a couple of those at line 2.16. Um, uh, um, but I'll look to see if there are questions or comments from members about the proposal. Give a minute to that. And as we're waiting that, I'll just um, thank you, Representative um, Bolden, uh, because uh, certainly this is uh, uh, connected in part to the presentation that we heard previously, but also something that really, I think, comes out of, I, I would hope, all of our all of our work in the last uh, six or seven weeks and recognizing that we have a crisis here and that uh, making sure we have affordable and high quality care that actually pays the people who, do, who does it uh, well um, is really important. So, Representative Pryor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Representative Bolden, for you know a great, I think, a, a great step forward um, for pulling together what we know are the different pieces of what's going on, um, and to really have a sustainable way of having an impact on this. Um, so I guess I'll just start with that comment of, of I think this is a really exciting um, proposal that we're hearing um, that really addresses the underlying need in a very positive, um, thoughtful way. So then here's my question, because I, I do want to hear more and learn more about it. Um, so I, you know, some of the things, I, we heard some dates about the pulling together the task force, um, some of the initial report, but then there is the date that was um, 2031. Um, and so kind of, can you then um, 
describe a little bit about what would be happening between that initial report coming out and then what we what we want to be that end point, which is in 10 years that we actually have affordable child care, high quality, affordable child care in Minnesota for every family. Uh, Representative Bolden. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Representative Pryor, for that question. It's a good one. And so um, just to take a step back to talk about that timeline a little bit. So basically the bill lays out a 10-year uh, a plan. Um, the task force would convene in uh, 2021, no later than September 1st, and uh, would continue its work through uh, early 2023. Uh, the task force plan will be submitted in early 2023. Um, the legislature and governor will then implement, implement those recommendations over the next two years. Um, and the plan will lay out a path towards the goals then from 2026 to 2031, so that by 2031, the affordability standard and other goals are met by that time. We know that this is a, this is a big undertaking. There, this is not something that can happen overnight, and we want to be uh, thoughtful uh, and inclusive um, in the plan. And we also want to um, not be... Um, disruptive to families who are utilizing these services in the meantime. And so it will be um, a thoughtful and deliberative process um, while still moving forward to those goals to be sure that we are um, making the changes. I mean, it will be, uh, there will be changes. And so I um, want to be thoughtful about that and, and to um, incur as little disruption for the families who need these services during that time as possible. And, and, and Representative Damoth, turn it to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Representative Bolden. A question for you. Um, what measures do you anticipate that the tax task force will recommend to help provider rates to um, maintain their affordability and to control those rates? What type of um, possible recommendations could a task force make? Uh, Representative Bolden. Thank you, Representative Damoth, for that question. So the bill um, lays out the goals of the task force. Um, the, the work of that task force is going to be to determine the details of the plan and how that moves forward. So I don't feel like I could make, um, you know, to say what those recommendations are going to be, that will be the work of the task force to make those recommendations. So with the goal of ensuring, you know, affordable access for all families, you know, regardless of, of race or place, um, and, and making sure that no families are paying more than that 7%, and making sure that we are uh, paying the, uh, you know, the folks, the professionals who are providing this care and doing this work, um, ensuring they're being paid a living wage. Those are the, are the goals of the task force that are being laid out. Um, but it will be the work of the task force who will be um, made up of, as I said, uh, those, it's, it's sort of delineated, those members meant to be inclusive and meant to be the people who are closest to this work um, across that spectrum. It will, that will be the work of the, of the task force to determine the details of, of how, we, how we reach those goals. Representative Damoth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, thank you, Representative Bolden. Um, so as, as you described that work and that uh, child's, um, it shouldn't be determined by their zip code. I would guess then by the task force, they would also be looking at the non-public schools um, for early learning and kindergarten along with that. That would be my assumption, but. Representative Bolden. Uh, thank you, Representative Damoth. So um, I have to pull out my bill here. So. Sorry, Chair, were you going to? No, I was just going to, when you say non-public school, did you mean other than the public schools, Representative Damoth? I'm sort um, of thinking as like. Far as, as far as private choices also, Mr. Chair. Right, yes, got it. So Representative Bolton. Thank you. Yep. So thank you, Mr. Chair. So the, 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 the task or the, the, the work of the task force will be looking at that, uh, you know, birth to age five, the, the care and education of, of our littlest Minnesotans, uh, you know, in that age range. Um, and, and we'll look at the entire delivery system, yes. And I guess if I'm, I think, Representative Damoth, you're asking, is it, um, it would, would Representative Bolden anticipate that it would, that it would only be for the public schools? Are we talking about other options, private choices, as you, as you referenced? Is that correct, Representative Damoth? That Damon? is correct, yeah. Okay. Representative Bolden, any, for, anything further on that before I move on? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just would say that, yes, it will look at the entire delivery system. Okay. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the bill author, Representative Bolden, under subdivision three, line 2.18 uh, and 
uh, individuals licensed early childhood teacher and a member of the licensed early childhood educator union. What what unions would would that involve for early childhood educator union? Representative Bowman. Thank you, Representative Jerkins, for the question. Um, I would have to look more into that. I don't have that those details in front of me. I, it's not specifying a specific union, but we it, again, it's intended to be uh, inclusive. Okay, Representative and, Jerkins. And, and, yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One other question on. Uh, I don't know what subdivision this is. Subdivision five four point one three. Um, identify the benefit mechanisms and infrastructure under which families will access financial assistance. What, what kind of me, uh, mechanisms is that? Is that em, employer provided benefits or I, I'm not sure what that is referring to. Representative Bowman. I'm sorry, Representative Jerkins, could you repeat the uh, line of the bill? Yes, that you're uh, referring to? Mr. Chair, it's uh, line 4.13 under subdivision six. Representative Bolden, you got that now? Line I do. 4.13. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just reading it over again. Thank you for the question. Um, identify the benefit mechanisms. So again, um, it, that uh, the the bill speaks towards the the goals of the task force, um, but the, the 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 details of that and and the determination of that will be the work of the task force. So I can't speak to what the proposal will be or what they will decide. It, it that will be the work of the task force to determine. Okay, I was, was just wondering Jordan's? if it was. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wondering if it was a reference to employee benefits or what that was. But um, thank you. So, sounds like it could be, but could represent Bolden. Sounds like it's you know this is the idea is to take a look at it. Um, and represent Bolden, can you just remind us where the seven percent figure came from? That that is, and we know that once kids turn five, of course, there's a zero percent parental contribution. You know, we have um, it's free at that point. But what do we? Where does the seven percent figure come from? Correct. So that is an affordability standard that is set out by the Federal Health and Human Services um, guidance. It's based on um, data and evidence and studies that have been done by folks, um, experts in this field and, and studies that have been done across the country and that Federal um, health, and human stand, uh, health and Human Services guidance. Thank you so much. So looking to see if there are other uh, questions. I don't see other hands that are raised. This, this is, bill is going to be laid over uh, for possible inclusion in a in a budget bill, um, but Representative Bolden, I really want to thank you so much for advancing this and, and your testifiers, um, and recognizing that this didn't uh, only come out of that um, that work uh, that collaboration we heard the first presentation about, but certainly um, that's been a strong contributor as well. And so many thanks to to, uh, to everyone who's pulled this together. Really appreciate it, and um, I'm hopeful that we're going to see this again. Looking to see anything else? I don't see any other hands. And Representative Bolden, I'm I'm sorry I should have given you the courtesy of any final comment that you have about your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, members, for the question and the discussion. Um, I, I would just end with, I think, um, you know, our work in this committee, we have seen over these last few weeks um, how, you know, the critical importance of the uh, the care and, and, and support and education that is, is done in these first years, and um, it is critically important that we uh, invest uh, in our littlest Minnesotans and, and the, the system as it stands right now is not working for many reasons. And so um, it is on us to, uh, to uh, improve that um, for, the, for the families uh, across Minnesota. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Representative Bolden. I see a last minute uh, sw uh, swing in from uh, Representative Franson, the, the lead, so Representative Franson, you got something? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, I do hope that we can bring the voices of family child care providers more to the table. Uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned by uh, just the little brief uh, testimony we heard from Ms. Cunningham. Uh, and as you know, as a licensed family child care uh, provider, uh, that, is my, um, that is my first love, um, aside from the child care industry itself. However, family child care plays an important role in Minnesota, in the child care industry, and across the state of Minnesota, and contribute greatly to our economy. Um, they are the, the, the link that holds our economy together. So, Mr. Chair, I just hope that we can um, have their voices as we move forward, or, or not move forward, but um, that we have their voices at the table. 
Thank you so much, Representative Franson. And, and I want to note uh, that we're going to be hearing the um, report and recommendations from our Family Child Care Task Force, who's done incredible work, a um, number of the folks in this committee um, working on that. And I want to, again, uh, confirm for folks that when you look at the numbers of this proposed task force, that it certainly includes family child care, both from greater Minnesota and from the metro, in addition to the other stakeholders, and really wanted to make sure that's included. Um, this conversation this morning has been somewhat truncated on this proposal only because um, we've had, in a way, the first um, two months of our committee have kind of been, in my view, somewhat a lead up to this and recognizing what a crisis there is for affordability, um, for high quality, and for the pay and compensation for people doing this work. Um, it's been kind of providing the context for this. And so I appreciate the continued discussion about it this morning. And, and again, I expect to be seeing it again. So thank you so much, Representative Bolden. Thanks for those comments, Representative France and everybody else. Um, and with that, um, the uh, chair is laying over um, House File 1278. Uh, and uh, Representative Katiza Watoon, you're up next. And would you like to move House File 1384 to place that before the committee? Thank you, Mr. Chair. That is my motion. Okay. And then please, Representative Katiza Watoon, present your bill and, <laughs> and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Good morning and happy Read Across America Day. I can't think of a better way to celebrate than to introduce you to House File 1384, which is an appropriations bill for an early childhood literacy program called Reach Out and Read. If you're not familiar with the wonderful work that they do across the state and across the country, I'm privileged to be able to share today. Reach Out and Read partners with clinics and pediatricians throughout Minnesota and assists them in implementing a literacy program that provides books to children between the ages of six months to five years at their regular well child checks. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, Reach Out and Read is the most studied and scaled prevention program, which seeks to prevent gaps in readiness before they emerge. I will allow my testifiers to speak more in detail of the program expansion over the past couple of years um, with uh, some state funding and the future goals as an organization. Uh, but I wanted to speak briefly about our focus here in this committee. As we've heard so many times, those first few years of a child's life are critical in brain development. Um, you may also be familiar with the million word gap or the difference in number of words that a child who has read to five books a day until they're five years old versus a child who has never read to. Um, based on calculations done by Je Dr. Jessica Logan of the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy at The Ohio State University, um, which I, I uh, sent this article for uh, members reference. Here are how many words kids would have heard by the time they are five years old if they were never read to. Um, just 4,662 words, one to two times a week, 63,570 words between three to five times a week, 169,520 words read to daily, 296,660 words. And then if they are read five books a day, 1,483,300 words. So this quickly becomes an equity issue and ties directly into that long reaching opportunity gap here in Minnesota. If families aren't able to build a home library, if parents are working multiple jobs or are unable to procure books in their native language, if children don't see caregivers modeling how to read in their home, they may not have the chance to read independently or the opportunity of learning to read for pleasure. So reach out and read doctors are able to introduce a book and share with the child and caregiver how to interact with that book, to turn the pages, to look at the pictures and encourage them to read together daily at home. I enthusiastically support this program as a legislator and a parent. Um, my child's eyes light up every time they visit our family doctor and she's written little notes to them inside the book covers. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would now like to introduce Kristen Hoplin, the Executive Director of Reach Out and Read, followed by Dr. Gigi Taula, Medical Director of Reach Out and Read in Minnesota, and the Chief, General, Chief of General Pediatrics at Children's Minnesota to share more about this wonderful program. Um, and I would also like to give a quick shout out to former Reach Out and Read Medical Director and current Medicaid Medical Director here in Minnesota, Dr. Nathan Chomolo, who now sits on the National Board of Reach Out and Read and is a former Eden Prairie Eagle. So, and I've got my little one here with his book, um, and hopefully he's going to distract himself for the rest of the hearing. <laughs> Thank you, Representative, Representative Kadiza Wittun. You had to get in the Eden Ferry plug, too. Was, oh, uh, yeah, you story. know it. <laughs> um, my Thanks. apologies to the remaining uh, testifiers for, for the tight time limits, but um, Ms. Hoplin, um, please identify yourself and um, proceed about your just wonderful, wonderful program. 
Thank you so much, Representative Cotizo Atun and Mr. Chair and the committee members for the opportunity to testify on House File 1384, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, Chris Hoplin, I'm the Executive Director of Reach Out and Read Minnesota. So Reach Out and Read is a national evidence-based organization of medical providers promoting early literacy and school readiness in primary care exam rooms by integrating children's books and parent education into well-child visits. The Reach Out and Read program invites caregivers to become invested in their children's education starting at the very beginning and gives parents the tools and knowledge to become their children's first and best teacher. So the goal of this legislation is to sustain the existing program and continue expanding the program statewide. Currently, we partner with 281 clinics in 58 Minnesota counties, and we serve almost half of Minnesota's children between the ages of six months and five years old. So we offer 204,000 children and their families a unique literacy experience. It's a priority for us that our books reflect the widest possible represent representation of children and families that we serve with stories that are relevant and engaging. We can offer books in 17 different languages in Minnesota. So within Reach on a Read, the medical providers incorporate a three-part model into the delivery of healthcare to young children by completing an accredited online training on how to speak with parents of infants, toddlers, and preschoolers um, about the importance of reading aloud at home, providing early literacy education and a new developmentally and culturally appropriate book at each well-child visit, and then creating literacy in rich environments at the clinics. So we've been around for 31 years and our research shows a few things, peer reviewed research shows that parents participating in the program are more off, uh, more likely to read to their children and more likely to cite reading at home as a favorite family activity. Children participating score significantly higher on measures of receptive and expressive languages, which are cognitive skills that serve as the foundation for their future learning. One study shows that children participating have a three to six month increase in language development prior to kindergarten. And Finally, well child visit attendance rates at clinics who implement Reach Out and Read um, are increased. So pediatricians who use the program, pediatricians and family practice doctors around the state are more likely to rate their, uh, their patients and families as receptive and families are more likely to rate their doctors as helpful and trustworthy. So Reach Out and Read Minnesota is asking the state to consider a two year funding plan of $300,000. This funding will allow our program to continue to expand across the state, particularly in underserved communities, and to help establish developmentally centered pediatrics as the standard of care for all Minnesota children. We estimate that with this funding, we would expand our total number of partner clinics by 15% each year, which would mean that by June of 2023, we would expand by approximately 84 clinics, bringing our total number to 365. A commitment from the state would also continue to signal to our current and future funding partners that our work is relevant and produces real results. The funding would be used in the following three ways, recruitment and onboarding of clinics to reach children in the state's highest need communities, providing thorough and effective training to our medical providers who implement the program and purchasing one year supply of books for all new clinics coming on. So we estimate this grant would allow us to reach over 28,000 new families annually. Again, located largely in Minnesota's highest need communities. So thank you for the opportunity to testify, Mr. Chair. Ms. Hoplin and uh, Dr. Chawla, a pleasure to welcome you to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Dr. Gigi Chawla and I'm a pediatrician and the Chief of General Pediatrics at Children's Minnesota. I live and practice in the Twin Cities and I'm here today as the medical director of Reach Out and Read Minnesota and on behalf of the Minnesota chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics to support House File 1384. Um, as it's been stated earlier, gaps in oral vocabulary become apparent in kids as early as 18 months to 24 months of age. And children who aren't read to in their first 1000 days of life have an increased risk of being part of the 30 million word gap noted upon entry to, to kindergarten, which may lead to achievement or opportunity gaps in school years and contribute to adults who are illiterate or with reduced employment opportunities. The impact of which can set up a lifetime course of poor outcomes and sets up their progeny for the same. Reach Out and Read Minnesota trains physicians and nurse practitioners to equip parents to be their child's first teacher and pairs that with a developmentally appropriate book at their doctor's visit between six six months and five years. 
This model has existed for over 30 years and is backed by over a dozen peer reviewed studies that show us that families served by clinics participating in Reach Out and Read are more likely to read to their children and that children subsequently score higher on expressive and receptive language scores. In my practice, I see patients of different socioeconomic backgrounds, race and ethnic groups, and health and disabilities. And the one universal experience is how offering a book is the entry of point for many discussions. In clinic, I recently walked into an exam room um, in which a parent and a two-year-old were at odds. It's a pretty familiar type of uh, entry. And um, with the two-year-old holding a cell phone and the parent trying to figure out if it was better that the toddler have the phone or not have the phone. By offering this child a book, the toddler dropped the cell phone, curled up into her parent's lap, and the interaction between the two became a positive one. Having the book right there and modeling its use in the exam room gives parents options and skills in that moment and gives clinicians the framework to have discussions about the amount of time kids spend on, on screens. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it remains important that children continue to receive well child checks as an entry point to get their vaccinations. Reach Out and Read has been an important program that provides both our providers and our patients a sense of comfort and normalcy that in that despite all the layers of PPE um, and in many instances is the driver for getting a child to their appointment for these needed immunizations. This past year has also been an opportunity for Reach Out and Read Minnesota to play a part of educating patients and families on diversity. We have used our connections and our resources to help pediatricians get books to families that celebrate, celebrate protagonists of all backgrounds and races and books written by diverse authors. When a parent reads to their child, a bond is strengthened. When a child loves reading, they acquire the tools to write their own story. And when they see diversity in the books that they read, this story is even more beautiful. Your support of House File 1384 will help ensure that children and families across our state have access to these tools. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Chawla, um, for presenting and for your really important work. So we've got just a couple of uh, couple minutes for questions, if, if anybody has any. Um, maybe uh, uh, if, if anybody can remind us, um, Reach Out and Read did receive funding last term, as I recall. Um, and I don't know if uh, perhaps Ms. Hopland would know or, or Dr. Chawla could just remind us about that. Yes, I can I can speak to that, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we Yes, we received funding the last um, session and we received uh, an appropriation of 75,000 a year the past two years. So we are asking for double that. Um, and with that funding, we were able to uh, do a couple things. One, we brought on 55 new clinics in the last two years. That's in spite of COVID-19, um, which is amazing. We have a, a lineup of clinics that really, really wanna do Reach Out and Read. Um, and we've also, we were able to hire a part-time staff person um, in Bemidji. So um, we're again, focused on our underserved communities, our rural communities, and we hope to continue to be able to do that. Thank you so much. Okay, let's just see if there's any final question or comment from anyone. Again, uh, uh, incredible the work you can do with just a simple, just a book um, with, uh, with your work. So um, Representative Juergens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just real briefly, uh, thank you, uh, Representative, for bringing this forward. Uh, one of the best parts of this job that I that we have is during February, I love to read month. I've in pre-COVID times, I've gone out to the schools in my districts in, a, in and around my district to read to students. I really miss that. So thanks for, for bringing this bill forward. My only question, I guess, though, is it we're asking for double the funding. It seems like it was doing pretty good. Um, what what further um, uh, benefits, I guess, do you want to say with the additional funding do you hope to hope to gain? Yeah, Ms. Hoplin or Dr. Chawla, um, see who steps in. Ms. Hoplin, I guess. Sure, <laughs> sure, I can speak to that. Thank you for the question. Um, just it's it's a scalable program, and so I really feel you know we really looked at the numbers. Every again, we have a list of clinics who who want to participate, and one of the things that's really important to us is um, sustainability. And so, with the clinics that came on board these last two years, we were able to provide their first year of book funding 
but the goal is always that the funding comes from the community. And so we're able to provide that first year of funding and then work with the clinic and the staff sort of on the ground in the community to find additional funding. So for example, we have a clinic in Faribault um, that's coming on board, really wanted to come on board, but we wanted them to have three years of funding. So we were able to do the first year and then find the a local foundation that agreed to fund the next two years. And so again, I think it's just, it's a scalability issue. Um, if we get the same amount of funding, we can hopefully do what we did this time. If we get double the amount of funding, then hopefully we can bring on double the amount of clinics and serve double the amount of families. Thank and you, and Representative Jurgens. Quick follow up, yeah, Representative Jurgens. And, and you said it in your testimony earlier. Was it 55 new sites in the past yes. year? No. Yes, Representative. Yes. Okay, yes. Good. Yeah. And so then, then Re Representative Jurgens. Well, just to doing the math, hopefully um, over 100 new new sites perhaps in the in the coming year with this funding. Ms. Hoplin? Yes, Representative, that's that's the goal for sure. Thank you. There's a lot I've, of interest. I've, I've heard Dr. Chomolos, I've, uh, thanks, Dr. Jolly. I've heard that Dr. Chomolos say, uh, you know, you, you give the books, we'll, we'll provide the doctor's time for free. Um, it's a pretty good deal. Um, but uh, Lee Franson, you had your, hope, I guess your hand is back down. So did- uh, uh, Mr. Chair, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I think, it's, it's a great program, I get it. Um, but I just still don't understand why we need to use taxpayer dollars if the community uh, buy-in is there. Uh, that's where you know the clinic really wants to participate in a program. That's what community help is for. You know, the, the clinic would ask for the community to help or the business partners. Um, of the community to to contribute to this cause, you know, if 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 they don't want to participate, that's fine. Or if they do, that's fine. But I just don't understand why we have to use taxpayer dollars for a program that seems to be doing pretty well without a lot of funding from the state. Ms. Hoplin or Dr. Chawla, can you provide your response to that? Dr. Uh, yes. Thank you for the thank you for the question, Mr. Chair um, and Representative uh, Franson. You know, I, I think um, this truly is an investment. It's an investment in children. Um, you know, I think if we leave it to communities to create a concept on their own and uh, create a driver to do this on their own, honestly, it the the barriers are such and the priorities are such that. Um, the needs of kids and the, the um, long-term investment probably isn't met. And so this program offers a, that jump start for um, communities all across our state to see the benefits and to be able to have that year or so of protection to be able to rally their communities um, towards this effort. So, so that's really what it, it's for is to help gain um, Help, help communities gain that uh, relationship of seeing the positive trajectory of, of reading. One thing I might ask on behalf of those of us on the committee is uh, if, if you all, because this will be coming, will be coming back up in a, in a budget bill potentially. And I think it'd be really helpful to get some more pointed information in response to Representative Franson's question in terms of kind of like, you know, what exactly we, are we getting when we put $100 into this? My sense is it really leverages a much bigger um, it, you know, it's getting us a lot, but if you could, if you could sort of provide a more pointed response to Representative Francis' question, I think I, I would find that very helpful. I suspect other committee members would as well, and then we can evaluate it together. Um, Representative Francis, I should let you follow up if you got anything. That's my thinking for is what we should get. Yeah, okay. Um, so we should end. Uh, uh, Representative Katiza Wittoon will give you a quick final word, then we can move on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I thank my testifiers today for all the work that they do. I'm, I'm particularly uh, in, enthusiastic about the expansion across greater Minnesota that you guys have um, put into in the, over the last two years. And I think that um, this program is, is just doing wonderful things and it's um, going to continue to grow and impact children all across the state of Minnesota. And hopefully, I mean, our, one of our biggest goals in this committee is to really stem that opportunity gap before it even starts. And so Reach Out and Read fits perfectly into that goal. So I appreciate member support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rep. Thank you Representative Katiza. We tune into your testifiers to great program. Uh, with that, uh, I'm the chair is laying over House File 1384, possible inclusion in a budget bill. Uh, Representative Morrison, you're up. Would you like to move House File 570 to place that before the committee? To, oops. Oh, am I frozen or maybe you are? 
I think it's uh, Representative Morrison. Um, but Andy, I'll make okay. a motion if you would like, Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rep Thank Thank you Representative Pryor. Well, I'd, I'd like to have you do that. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. And um, and then Representative Morrison, I know, has an author's amendment. We'll see if we can get her uh, un, uh, uh, unfrozen here. Uh, Representative Morrison, do we have you? Perhaps not. Um, let's see here. Uh, I think that she is going to, and I think that she, there was one person who, testified, who signed up to testify, but I think that she was just going to present the bill on her own. Um, I wonder if we may need to, one moment, everybody, we could move to your bill, Representative Pryor, potentially. Let's see if we get Representative, Representative Morrison back in. Um, maybe, you know, if we could, let's have, um, okay, we had to have her out. Okay, um, I think what, what I'd like to do is flip around and have, um, oh, Representative Morrison, you're back. There we go, Represent, yeah, Representative Morrison. There. No Tec problem, Representative. Temporary technical difficulties. No problem. <laughs> Representative Pryor moved your bill. Um, I understand you have an A1 author's amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have an A1 author's amendment. Could you just tell us briefly about that uh, so we can get yeah. the bill in the shape you wish? Yes, the A1 author's amendment uh, comes from our committee discussion about this bill last year, and it exempts um, children who have uh, IEPs from the language of the bill. Okay. And so uh, all in favor of approval of the A1 amendment, simply to put the bill in the form of Representative Morrison prefers, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the bill, the motion passes, the amendment is added. Representative Morrison, if you can describe your bill, I think you do not have any testifiers. We have one person who signed up to testify. If you can tell us about it, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. House file 570 does two things. It limits the use of individual screens and publicly funded preschool or kindergarten programs without engagement from a teacher or other students. And secondly, it creates a public education campaign to educate parents on the effects of screen use on children under the age of five. The data about the effects of excessive screen use on our youngest children is growing and the news is not good. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no screens before 18 months, except for video chat, and a maximum of one hour a day for ages two to five, and only if co-viewed with an adult. As we have discussed extensively in this committee, the brain develops rapidly in the first five years, and young children and babies require a relational experience for healthy brain development. They learn best by direct experiences with their senses, whole bodies, and live interaction. Screens take away from exploration, creative play, reading, talking, and singing, which are all cr critical for early development. Parents of young children need to be educated about not only what screen use does to a child's brain, but also about their own use of screens when in the presence of their child. JAMA Pediatrics reported in 2019 that kids under the age of five exposed to screens just one hour per day experienced cognitive decline, struggling with language and memory functioning. The early years of life are critical to brain development and the beginning of the establishment of lifelong habits. This bill creates guardrails for kids, parents, and families and encourages healthy digital habits. Thank you very much for hearing House File 570, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Before we do, I know that we have a testifier. So, uh, Ms. Cunningham, um, you can, uh, uh, we heard from you earlier. Please uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Cindy Cunningham. Uh, I am testifying for licensed child care providers in Minnesota, McPin. And on behalf of McPin, I'm testifying in support of House File 570. And I'm very appreciative that Representative Morrison has brought this bill forward in the process or in the stance that it is. The pandemic's brought forth many strengths, but many weaknesses. Child care providers and centers and family child cares have been on the hands-on and much of the technology use in our educational system as it has had to take place. The use of screen time in our environments goes against what early childhood educators are taught and understand regarding education, child development, and brain development. The use of technology in education is developmentally inappropriate for our youngest. Its uses as entertainment and distraction for our youngest is harmful for development and denies a child's ability to learn from their environment. Education for hours a day, whether it's with an instructor or independently, needs parameters and direction for educators. Early childhood educators already know this. The experience during this pandemic has been unencumbered as teachers and educational systems not trained in early child education and teaching by technology have done their absolute best to manage through this pandemic. However, two to six hours a day in front of a screen is detrimental 
Yesterday, there was a report on Zoom fatigue regarding adults. Can you imagine how our children feel? Back in the classroom, children go, they will be conditioned to be on screen and have their and their personal skills have not been fully utilized through this pandemic. Educators deserve direction and parameters to follow. There has not been any direction or parameters previously. Parents have been doing their best. Often that means having young children in front of screen so that the adult can work or attend to other matters. This dynamic goes on increasingly in our society. How many children are sitting in carts in the store with a cell phone in their hands? The screen is in place of interacting with their environment and people around them, the sights, the smells, and the sounds. All of this is what children's need, in particular are our youngest, not a screen. The APA, the World Health Organization, along with organizations like Common Sense Media, all in line with a less is more approach to technology. Parents need education and support in the complex world of raising children with technology, where it has been strongly promoted and recently increasingly used for our educational needs. So it has become the norm. Please support this bill. Schools need clear parameters. Parents need ed educated in this process. Again, thank you, Representative, for bringing this forward. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Uh, so that we've got a couple minutes for questions, members. Uh, to confirm, the bill does appropriate um, funds, uh, and so uh, it's going to be laid over for possible inclusion of budget bill. Just so we're we're clear on that. Um, but are there questions or or comments? Those on the committee last term may remember a pretty robust discussion uh, about this proposal uh, at that time. Um, okay. Looking to see if there is. And uh, looks like there's not. And so Representative Morrison will give you a, a chance to give any final comments about your bill before we move on to our, our last bill of the day. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members for considering this bill. Uh, I think we've learned a lot this year and I, it's very timely that this bill followed um, Representative Katiza Watoons. I think they are, there is overlap in relation to them. We need to get our youngest Minnesotans away from screens. Uh, thanks for the consideration. Thank you so much, Representative Morrison. And with that, uh, the chair lays over House File 570 uh, as amended for possible inclusion in a budget bill. And with that, uh, Representative Pryor, you have the last bill, uh, House File 1467. Would you like to move uh, that bill to place it before the committee? Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Chair, that is my motion. Thank you. It looks like no author's amendments. Uh, and so, uh, Representative Pryor, and if you, I know you're gonna have Ms. Mock, I think, walk through this bill. And if you wanna start with that doing that first, or if you want to um, go first, whichever is your preference. Well, I think I'll start with the introductory remarks and uh, okay. then the walkthrough of the bill. Representative Pryor. All right, thank you. The Child Care Assistance Program helps parents work where their children benefit from being in an enriching early learning environment. This program is run by DHS and administered by counties. Approximately 15,000 families and 30,000 children across the state use this program. It is a ladder out of poverty for families across the state struggling to find affordable childcare. There are two funding streams for childcare assistance. The bill I am introducing today will help families access basic sliding fee childcare. This funding stream is for families who are not on MFIP. These families are the working poor, families who need a little assistance to maintain their self-sufficiency. Over 80% of parents accessing basic sliding fee childcare are essential workers. These are our neighbors who work in grocery stores, gas stations, and other frontline businesses. Helping families access basic, basic sliding fee childcare is key to getting parents back to work. Basic sliding fee childcare is a key component of COVID-19 recovery. Um, BSF, basic sliding fee funding, isn't sufficient to meet the need we see across the state counties receive an allocation to serve families in this program, and they must keep within this dollar limit. When there isn't enough BSF funds to meet the need in their area, a county starts a wait list. The bill I'm introducing today will help families access BSF funding childcare sooner. It simplifies the way the wait list works and will direct funding to those who need it most, while also reducing the administrative burden on counties who manage this critical program. This change will help our communities recover from the economic impacts of COVID and it will make a difference for families all across the state as they're able to return to work confident that their children are in a safe, caring, early learning environment. Okay, thank you, um, thank you Representative Pryor. And so Ms. Mock, if you can just uh, walk us through the bill and explain it. It's, um, it's uh, 
it can be a little bit confusing at first. Um, and so if you can please just uh, walk us through it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so House Bill 1467 makes changes to the BSF Child Care Assistance Program. Section one of this bill changes how families are prioritized on the BSF waiting list. So there are two primary changes. One change is moving the transition year extension families from the second priority group to the last priority group. And these transition year extension families are families who are receiving MFIP child care assistance while they are on the BSF waiting list. And again, they move from the second priority group to the last priority group. A second change is the addition of a new priority group. And that group is eligible families who do not fit in at any other priority groups. And these families would become the third priority group under this bill. Uh, these changes to the priority groups would be effective July 1st, 2021. Section two of the bill modifies the formula for allocating BSF funding to the counties for their programs. The bill deletes a component of the current law formula that would allocate up to one quarter of BSF funding according to the number of families in the first three priority groups on each county's waiting list. So that part of the uh, formula would not exist any longer. And then the bill modifies a different component of the formula to provide that up to one half of BSF funding is allocated according to the average number of families on each county's most recent 12 months of waiting list. So taking into account all the families in all the priority groups. Um, and these changes to the allocation formula would be effective January 1, 2022, and the changes would phase in over the 2022 calendar year. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mock. Uh, let's move to, I, I should just pause, uh, see if folks have particular clarification questions. I see Representative Bolden that you do, so please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a uh, uh, clarification. The intention and effect of this bill would be for more families to have access. Is that a fair statement? Representative Pryor, I guess that seems like it's directed to you. Right. Um, it, it is to make sure that uh, we move families, we hold down the waiting lists um, and that families start getting access to it. So it's, it's something that more and more counties are seeing, um, particularly it, it started before um, you know, COVID, before the pandemic, um, that more counties were seeing these waiting lists and we were never, some families never moved off the waiting list. And so this is a way of shifting around the priorities where we can move families off the waiting list. Um, and but keep all families um, receiving this benefit no matter what their funding stream is. And I know that um, some counties like Olmstead County, this is very high priority for them right now. And, and Representative Bolden, I should note, we, we may get a little more insight into your question from the next, we have, we have two testifiers, so it may make sense to hear from them and that may be helpful too. So um, yeah, why don't, we, why don't we move to that? I'm gonna have a clarification question too, but I think it makes sense to, to hear from our testifiers first and then go to the member questions. So uh, Elena Gravitz, if you can please um, identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Let's see if we can, I can see you're unmuted. Oh, Ms. Gravitz. Yeah, I have my camera on. Can you guys see me? I, I cannot, um, but and I guess other people are shaking their heads too, but that's that's okay. We can hear you. Okay. So uh, why don't you, yeah, go for it, please. All right. Thank you. Um, Chair Pinto and members of the committee, my name is Alana Gravitz, and I manage the Basic Sliding Fee Child Care Assistance Program at Hennepin County. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 1467, and thank you, Representative Pryor, for chief authoring this bill. I have been managing Hennepin County's Basic Sliding Fee Waitlist for nine years, and we have never had enough money to meet the community need. This is a statewide issue. There are over 2000 Minnesota families waiting for access to affordable childcare through basic sliding fee. There are wait lists in Grant, Nobles, Dakota, Olmstead and Scott counties, just to name a few. The bill before you today addresses a critical issue in the structure of the basic sliding fee wait list. Counties are not allowed to help many families in need of childcare assistance because we are required to first use our limited basic sliding fee funding to pay for families who are already receiving service. Current statute requires, requires us to first use our limited allocation dollars to pay for families that are receiving childcare assistance while they are on the wait list. This is childcare assistance paid for with MFIP dollars and these are families who are transitioning off of MFIP and the basic sliding fee. So in the bill walkthrough, these are the families they would stay on the wait list and families would eventually be paid for by basic sliding fee funds from the counties, but we would put them at the end of the wait list 
after the other families that we would like to pay for who are not receiving any childcare assistance at all. House file 1467 will immediately help new families access childcare assistance while those families transitioning off of MFIP will continue to be helped. We have families that have been on our wait list since Halloween. And at one point we had families waiting for two and a half years as policymakers who understand the critical importance of the first three years of life, you know, the tremendous developmental opportunities that are missed when infants and toddlers aren't able to be in the enriching early learning environments that childcare assistance can provide. The parents of these children want to work and in our time of COVID recovery, we need them to work. This bill supports young children, working parents and our state's economy as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Sanford, you are our last uh, testifier of the day. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, just getting my notes ready. And as you do, I'm just gonna ask Representative Juergens if okay, we're gonna have your question after Ms. Sanford. That's yeah, all right. Yeah, that's what I intended. It might be answered here, thank you. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Sanford, please. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Claire Sanford and I am on the board of the Minnesota Child Care Association. I'm pleased to support this bill. One of those that's not sexy, but complicated and behind the scenes and has an incredible impact on real life. CCAP is not easy for families or providers. Uh, one parent I worked with earlier in my career uh, likened using CCAP to having another part-time job and many providers agree. An incredible amount of time is spent assisting families and navigating the system of county child care workers and employment counselors. Yet it is an incredibly important and necessary piece of our statewide child care infrastructure. The wait list is a never ending issue. Families come to child care providers needing help with tuition. We refer them to CCAP. Too often they come back and say, they told me the wait list is two years long. Often families don't even get on the wait list because it's so long. These families then face a quick series of impossible choices, leave or don't enter the workforce, find alternative, sometimes less safe childcare arrangements, et cetera. I used to think these wait times were solely due to our underfunding of CCAP, which is no doubt a huge piece but a few years ago, I learned of this administrative quirk that this bill addresses that was adding to the misery of many families. No wonder many families wait forever or never get off the list. They're patiently waiting on the basic sliding fee wait list for their name to be called, entirely unaware that others are constantly moved to the front of the line that they're in. This explains so much of what I have heard countless frustrated parents say, if I just quit my job and go on MFIP, I'll get childcare right away. The current wait list priority for basic sliding fee contributes to perverse incentives for families to actually step back in their economic stability in order to get a support necessary for it. This bill would allow actual new families to be served through CCAP instead of shuffling, shuffling families already receiving it from one side of its funding ledger to the other ahead of families already waiting on the ladder. It's also designed to hold those families who begin receiving CCAP through the MFIP bucket of funding harmless they will not lose child care assistance as part of this bill. They'll simply stay on one side of the funding ledger longer so families on the other side may advance. This is a common sense step that will have real and immediate impact on children and families. And I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanford. Uh, Representative Juergens. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm trying to make sure that I understand this. If additional families or new families receive this, this funding, is there an increase in funding needed or is it just shifting who's getting that funding? Uh, let's see who's the right person to answer that. You can start uh, uh, Representative Pryor possibly or possibly Ms. Mock in terms of how the bill works. I'm looking to see who's the right person. Representative Pryor, we'll start with you. And I, I, it looks like uh, Mr. Berg is gonna take over to uh, <laughs> the, the definitive answer. Uh, just one thing to understand is we're talking about funding streams. So um, the one group of families are going to be staying on the funding stream that comes from MFIP. And at this point, it's the extension of, of MFIP. Um, and then, but the, the new people that instead of going sitting on a waiting list that they nev may never get off, they'll be the ones that are receiving the funding stream through basic sliding fee. Um, so, and, and, Right. So, I mean, and that's actually, so that's what we're focusing on is to sustain some families where they are in that funding stream and by use um, and by keeping them where they are 
then we actually get to help new families. Okay. Let's um, let's maybe get. Oh yeah, Mr. Representative Jurgens, all right. We could direct no, you, Mr. Berg. Otherwise, but follow up after him. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Berg, if you can help us with that. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Pryor has it right, and uh, Representative Jurgens, there is a fiscal note on the on this bill. It will show a cost. The families that would remain under this on MFIP transition year, and the in the current world. They move off MFIP transition year and they take up some of the money on basic sliding fee. In this case, they will stay on MFIP transition year and other families will get the basic sliding fee. The basic sliding fee appropriation will not change unless the legislature chooses to change it, but it doesn't go up because of this. The MFIP transition year appropriation is a forecasted program and so those families that would have moved to basic sliding fee will stay on MFIP and that will have a cost. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, yeah, that, that helps explain it. Do we know what that cost is? And is that a state cost or does that get pushed down to the counties? Who, who pays for that extra? Uh, Mr. Berg. Mr. Chair, Representative Jurgens, it is a state cost in MFIP. I mean, the counties do administer MFIP, but the, I don't think it, this requires additional administrative costs on their part. There will be an MFIP state cost. Um, part of the MFIP program is funded by TANF funds, but those do not go up because of this. We get a block grant from the feds, so there will be additional state costs. Uh, and uh, I think, was there another part of your question I missed? Well, I think the, fir the first yeah, what is the that? First part of yeah, oh, uh, yeah, the amount. There's a, there's a pending fiscal note, so I don't know the exact amount. There was legislation in the sixth, maybe special session. There is an old fiscal note on this that I could dig up and circulate. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what the number for that is. And we can, yeah, and, and, and just Representative Jurgens, for you to be aware and others too, um, there were a number of discussions about this last year, including in, in this, Mr. Berg said as one of the special sessions. So we did get a cost at that point, but this might be different. So we're still w awaiting the fiscal note on this bill. Representative okay. Jurgens. Yeah. No, no further well, questions. That, yeah. that answers the best we can for right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Berg and Representative Pryor. Yeah, thanks Representative Jurgens. Um, Representative Wozilek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real quick, um, I, I can't recall, I'm not super familiar with how this works, but. Is there a time limit or some sort of cutoff for those families that are getting child care assistance that are transitioning off of MFIP? Is there some sort of endpoint for that? I'm just thinking about if those families are off, how that might um, how that might impact the cost that, that we're talking about right now. With anyone who would know the answer to that question, um, I believe there might be a, a, a Stacia uh, Rosas from DHS who may be may be on and, and available for answer questions. So, uh, Ms. Gravitz, it looks like you. I think you maybe had your hand raised. Representative Pinto and Representative, um, if I'm understanding your, correct, your question correctly, when people leave MFIP, their childcare continues for as long as they are eligible. And eventually the funding source switches from MFIP dollars to the county's basic sliding fee allocation. And they, again, continue to be eligible and funding isn't an issue. So what this would do is extend the MFIP funding for however long it's needed until the county can serve the other families who aren't yet receiving any child care at all. But um, as Ms. Sanford said in her testimony, the, all the families are held harmless. Representative Wozniak, that's got you Thank covered. You. Yep, that's helpful. Thank you. Good, thanks. It probably is really important to note this has come up a couple points, but just, you know, it's basically, as I understand it, taking this forecasted program of MFIP, which is designed to meet the need, and kind of relying more on that rather than the program that says, you know, we're going to have a certain amount of money and not necessarily meet the need. And this is trying to make sure that we shift low income families to the program that is designed to, to meet the need would be one way of putting it. Um, I have just one question. I'm not seeing other hands. And if, if you if somebody could just um, the, the lines 2.28 to 2.33, the stricken section is not kind of walk through that. But I guess I'm still a little unclear. And then our, you know, 120 seconds left here. If anybody can just just give some insight into into the impact of, of deleting that section or the reason for that. That may be Ms. Gravitz or Ms. Sanford, perhaps, um, or perhaps uh, Representative Pryor, but um, is there uh, either of our testifiers able to, to give any background on that? Otherwise, I might ask for you to provide that after this hearing. 
with the Ms. Rabbits. Looks like you're unmuted. Yeah. Yeah, Representative, I can jump in. And I'm so sorry, I don't have the bill lines in front oh. of me. Is that the section with the formula change? That's exactly right, Ms. Gravitz, yeah. Um, so the current formula is incredibly complicated, and this is a small step towards simplifying it. So it makes okay. it combines two factors and weights them as half. And it basically just says we care about the whole size of the county's wait list. The other the earlier language, the, the current language says we care about the first three priorities, and then we also care about all the priorities, and it kind of overweights those families coming off of MFIP who now might be on longer, and it doesn't really show the community needs. So I, probably many of you know the basic sliding fee formula is incredibly complex, and this is just a, a small step towards simplifying it. That's that's very helpful. So Representative Pryor, uh, final words in our final couple seconds here? Yeah, final seconds. Um, so I... It's as, as our testifiers have said, um, it is a complicated system, but what we're trying to do is help families that whose needs not being met right now. And when we think about how this pandemic, um, but even before the pandemic, um, that group of families that are struggling, you know, they're the ones that work in the grocery stores and the gas stations. And it used to be, you couldn't even, you know, that was where our, um, there was a huge pinch, um, pinch where um, employers were looking for employees well, the truth is those employees couldn't afford to take those jobs uh, because they couldn't pay for their childcare and they couldn't get onto the basic sliding fee childcare assistance. So I think this is a need that was true before the pandemic. It's been a need that's true during the pandemic and it's gonna be a need that's true after the pandemic. So hope that when we put together our, our final um, finance bill that this is, can be something that we look seriously at. Thank you so much, so much Representative Pryor. With that, uh, the chair lays over House File 1467 for possible inclusion in a budget bill. Um, I'll note members, uh, another uh, busy day on Thursday looking at some home visiting proposals. Look for some uh, uh, revisions to that agenda as we're um, just trying to move things quickly here. Please keep in touch. Thank you so much for your focus and, and attendance today and many thanks to all of our testifiers. With that, the meeting is adjourned. We'll see you on Thursday. Thanks so much.